say a little bit about your background and then lead us through the reading. I'm 10 days away from being 78, so I've had a long time to live, and um, I'm so grateful to be here. I've been the last 15 years working on nonviolent communication because I needed it. And one of the great things that I've learned about in nonviolent communication is what Marshall Rosenberg's called giving gratitude. I find it's one of the best things that I've learned because it says in doing, giving gratitude, you don't tell people who they are, but you tell them what they do for you. So when I was invited to come, I, I, she told me about your class and I thought, it's so inspiring for me to see people from all backgrounds, ages, interests, coming together to work on war, peace, and religion. It, I, when I heard even the topic of the, the name of the, your class, I thought, isn't it, uh, it's such a gift that you would take time to engage the topic, because so many people don't want to look at it or they find other things that are much more exciting to do. So thank you for being here. It inspires me, so I just want you to know. So that's a way of giving gratitude. I also want to give gratitude to a fellow by the name of Bill Ligon. Some years ago, it was probably 13 years ago, I happened to be over at the Y and this woman said, oh, I think you would really enjoy a class with, with a, it's a drum circle with djembe. And I thought, oh, I've always wanted to do play drum. And so she said, well, come, and we have this drum class and it was a, in an old garage part. And the fellow that was leading it was uh, Bill. He was an old Vietnam vet. And he was actually younger than I, but he was an old Vietnam vet. And his um, gracious way of always inviting everyone in to the class, no matter when you started, uh, in terms of if you'd only begun drumming, he had always start from the beginning and give the basics. So everybody was always welcome. It was this great way of inclusion, which I so appreciated. Others who were really good at playing it, they, I think they got a little bit, uh, uh, what? They would like to have gone further, but he always included people. That was a great lesson for me. Anyway, Bill had uh, work, was working with what's called Veterans Heart. It's a group around the country where you sit in a circle with civilians, civilians and former veterans who tell their story and the civilians simply listen. That's the part. So Bill invited me to come to that. And it was such a profound experience to hear from veterans their experience of war and coming out of war, the woundedness that comes out of being a veteran. Um, I had always been on the protest side, so it was good for me to listen and hear what others had experienced, even from protesters, that um, was difficult for them in some ways. Uh, Bill always went down to the School of Americas and drummed outside the gates, and I was always at the School of Americas for the last, I suppose, 17 years. Um, so we got to be good friends. Well, Bill died this past year, but it turned out that somebody had contacted Kay Coker, who leads the Veterans Heart, and uh, she, was the one who contacted somebody here that got me here. That's how I got around here. I tend to have thinking that's, I call it go for thinking. I will say something, then I go for a while underground and come up <laughs> over here, and people are wondering, how'd you get from here to here? So it has to do with gratitude. Um, Bill's influence in my life, I learned to drum, djembe, I love drumming. Uh, I un began to understand veterans better that I had not even known veterans except my brother. Um, so, and the gratitude for coming here to speak and you're listening, so thank you. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about my background in terms of, I, I'm a Catholic sister. Um, this is my, I entered in 1955, so you can do the, the 60th year I've been into. Um, somebody said, well, what, what does that mean? If you've ever volunteered at something, it means you're a long-term volunteer of service and uh, living life in community. I am so grateful. I belong to what's called a group called Cincinnati Dominicans. We're out of Wisconsin. It's, uh, the name is two sins and an awa. <laughs> the, 
<laughs> and it's right across from Dubuque, Iowa, if you know Dubuque, Iowa. So we have a big community house there. Um, when I was invited to come, I was feeling a little bit anxious. And I told Catherine that one of um, a lesson that I learned from a fellow by the name of Edwin Friedman, uh, he wrote a book called Generation to Generation. It's an old book, a clinical pastoral education. That's how I happened to get down here at Atlanta because I wanted to become a chaplain and take this clinical pastoral education. I started out at Grady, then I up, ended up over at St. Joe's and got my thing there. Anyway, Edwin Friedman talked about uh, three, th four things. He said for leadership, the first thing you need to be is a non-anxious presence. And um, I'm a little anxious right now, so it's not <laughs> I, I need to keep living into being a non-anxious presence. Uh, the second one is to take responsibility for what's in your sphere. Whatever you're doing, just be responsible for that. One of the great lessons of my life, I was on a team, and it's when email just started. Now, you're all probably post-email, but at the time, it was a big deal to have email. So we'd had a meeting, and I had taken down notes, and the woman who was really the secretary treasurer was um, supposed to be doing this. And I thought, well, she didn't know how to do email. So I typed up, I wrote up the notes and sent it out. And the next day, she came back, and she said, why did you do that? I said, well, I knew it would take you a long time to type it on the typewriter. Um, I could do it. And she came back and said, that wasn't your responsibility. It was a huge lesson. Because any time you overfunction, or I overfunction, or underfunction, we deprive the other person of being, of learning and being their best persons. So um, take responsibility for what's in your sphere. Don't over or under function. Um, the next one is don't blame or shame. I find our culture is so blaming and so shaming, and it demeans us all. So um, avoid it at all costs. And the fourth one is don't get triangled. In other words, if I got something to say to somebody else, go directly. Um, I have a nephew who um, is finding life difficult. And he calls me and starts complaining about somebody. And the other, I said, David, I, I, can't, I can't go there. I, it's, not, it's not helpful to you or to, for me to be triangled. If you have something, you need to go directly to them. So um, it's a great lesson. Another great lesson was from a fellow by the name of Harrison Owen, who wrote, wrote uh, Riding the Tiger. And he said, um, whoever shows up are the right people. Uh, when it starts, it starts. Whatever happens, the only thing that could happen. And when it's over, it's over. Uh, sometimes when I give talks, people, you know, it might be only just a couple people. And uh, somebody said, oh, aren't you disappointed? And I said, no, it's the right people that came, because they're the ones that want to be here. And you're the right people. Uh, and uh, we started, so. Uh, would you take just a moment to give, um, take a deep breath, and um, I really ask you to send me, um, we live in morphogenic fields, and I need uh, your help here. When I came in, I looked at this classroom, and I thought, eh. Um, this is a terrible way to have a classroom set up. It's, uh, it's like I have the information and you don't. We all have the information. We should be in one large circle. I was imaging a place where we had chairs and we were sitting in a large circle. <laughs> you know, we're all lined up. And um, education doesn't work that way any longer. It, we've got to get in circles. It just, have any of you done any MOOCs, massive online courses? open. Okay. It's the future, and I keep thinking our educational system is really in desperate need of changing where we've come from and how we're doing it. Um, it's the circle that's going to be doing it. So anyway, would you ask the spirit to please um, help me to present what you need to hear and what I need to say? I, I count on you. And if we were in a big circle, we'd just kind of be sending that to each other. So 
I do want to leave time at the end. I have enough stuff to last for three weeks. <laughs> I always over-prepare because I get nervous and think, oh, I've got to have more. Um, I think my interest in beginning had to, uh, with peace and war and religion. It came out of the stories of my family. My great-grandfather was a conscientious objector, this is on my mom's side, from Germany. And he came and um, went to South Dakota, was married. They had three children. They lived in a dugout. And the story that's come down to me is the three little kids and the mother lived in the dugout while the, my great-grandfather traveled up and down the Missouri River doing shoes. He was a shoemaker. Uh, in the dugout, they had chickens and potatoes, and that's what they lived on during the whole winter time. And they li where they were, there was kind of a creek, and the grandmother would always go down to the creek to get water, and sometimes it was ice she had to get in the winter time. And she tied a, she was a small woman, they tied a rope around her. So the three, when she yanked on the rope, the three little kids, and then helped pull her up the, up the um, embankment. And um, this one time she went down and she didn't pull on. And the three youngsters realized, it was one of them was my grandfather, realized that there was something wrong. And the three little kids pulled her up the embankment. She had passed out for some reason or other. And they patted her until she finally came to. I've often thought that we need to look at the children. Yesterday I was over at the Y and there was one little kid sitting there and I thought, I just need to look at him because the life and the energy that came out of him was so powerful and so profound. I just wanted to hug him. I didn't, but it was one of those sense of, of the life in this youngster. How do we pay attention to kids? I think little youngsters, if we could kind of return to that great life that they have and share it in some ways, it has such power for us. So these youngsters pulled her up and that's how my grandfather got here. My grandmother um, came from Virginia. I think that family was a little snooty, I don't know. Kind of, anyway, they married. Um, and then my mother, um, she, uh, when she, she graduated from high school at 16, went to college. She was in love with this one fellow who was, uh, my mother was Catholic. The fellow was uh, Lutheran. And in those days, Lutherans and Catholics didn't mix. And uh, it turned out that his, the fellow's dad was the pastor at a college, a Lutheran college. So my mom's father and the, the guy's father, they got together and they decided, no, they couldn't get married. Now, unfortunately for my mother and for the other fellow, they were very disappointed and sad and had to separate. For me, it was a lucky stroke because <laughs> had it been otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, I, no, um, I keep thinking, we, we've all come from two people and those two people have come from four people and those four people have come from eight. Just know that each one of us is so, um, we're so profoundly unique. 50, what is it, 50 trillion cells in our body and all that has come from this genetic uh, process that's brought us to be who you are. Uh, Margaret Mead always says, know that you're absolutely unique, just like everybody else. Huh? But uh, it keeps us humble to know we are just like everybody else. But we're also absolutely unique. This, the, the light that's come from 13 point, almost 14 point billion years ago, is centered in you now, uh, in me. We are this manifestation of this huge evolutionary process that brought us here. And uh, you see with those eyes. Huh? Uh, Meister Eckhart has this wonderful statement. He says, the eyes with which you see God are the same eyes with which God sees you. So you're the manifestation of this gift that has been given to each one of us, unique, marvelous. Um, I'll never get through all of this. Um, I think um, my folks, the, my dad was, um, all came from Ireland uh, during the famine, so they all knew uh, um, what it was to be hungry. Um, 
There were 13 of them that came on one boat. One uh, girl didn't come because she was afraid of the ocean. And the others encouraged her to come. And the boat she came on went down. So I think the only lesson in that is don't let your fears get you. Uh, stay with uh, I think fear can prevent us from doing things that we need to do and to step out there. Um, I grew up during the time of World War II. Um, I so strongly remember when I was in grade school, we used to go along the railroad and pick milkweed pods because they used the silk from the milkweed pods to put in uh, the lifesavers the, 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 at the time. Um, Mom also had these zinc lids at that time for jars, we always canned food, and I lived on a farm. And the jars had a piece of glass on the top, and part of the war effort was you knocked out the glass and crushed the zinc so you could send the zinc to help with the war effort. So the, the war was very much a part of my life. Of, uh, at that time, it were, you, know, you had rations uh, for gas and for sugar. Um, I remember there was no elastic because when we had whooping cough, uh, our underwear, we always had to, we ran to the coal scuttle with one hand over the mouth and the other hand holding up the pants because the, the pants simply, there was no elastic. Um, There's so many things about the war that I think, uh, I'm still a product of that war and all the things that went before that. Uh, I'm a great saver, not exactly a hoarder, but everything, uh, you know, I, I, recycling is big for me. I want to read some, uh, the little piece of the paper I recycle, I can think. Where does this come from? And yet it's, I think it's all part of um, where I came from. My brother, um, my oldest brother, joined the uh, Marines when I was in grade school. And when he came back, he was so tough and so foreign to me. Um, we had a big hill behind our house and I would escape because I was not gonna be part of his little military thing that he had. I had three younger sisters. Um, there were four older brothers. Two of them died uh, early on. Um, so I would run up to the hill on top of this hard, vast hill. And um, if I didn't want to go along with what he was saying, we had to do. And, but I could survey out across the Missouri River it was, and see over into Council Bluffs, Iowa. And it was one of those expansive times in my life as a child where it was a huge gift, a contemplative gift that I gained from being able to see vast areas. And at the same time, we had this old gully where I used to run up along the side where evident animals had um, made a little track. And it was kind of overgrown, and I could crawl in there, and there were wild strawberries and wild ferns. And again, it fed my contemplative spirit. And I think that that was part of how I came to be um, so much interested in war and peace and religion because it was, it was, it was part of my, I just kind of thirsted for the contemplative side of life, um, enjoyed it. Uh, my brother and I didn't hit it off very well for some time. We later on um, <laughs> came to reconciliation. Um, my folks were very much um, people of great social justice. We had a clan that lived down below where we lived and uh, I've never yet understood what it was, but as a group of kind of young people, there was one older man and one younger woman, and she seemed like she was the only one who was working, and she never had uh, much. And my mom always saw to it that she got shoes, that she got boots, and my mom would take her over to the highway where she'd catch a ride. Um, the older fellow always came with his milk can to get our milk, that because we, we, we hand milked, and get the milk for the clan. And there were two young boys, that, uh, one was by the name of Elmo, and I can't remember the other fellow's name, kid's name. They always stopped at our house for breakfast before we'd go on to the country school. And, and my dad had fixed up in the Haymow a place where people who were travelers, um, usually men who didn't have a place where they could stay overnight, and then they were always invited for breakfast in the morning. And so the, the strong sense that my folks had about social justice, of working with the that everybody had dignity and needed to be cared for, and they were always welcoming. I remember one time we found a bunch of, my brother found a bunch of hides from the hogs that had, well, dad said they needed the food. He knew that they had taken the hogs and butchered them and um, had, their, <laughs> had their meals from the, 
the farm, uh, the, really the hogs, my dad, but dad never said anything. It was, it was so, um, they needed it. Um, when I was a kid, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I remember the day that he died because the neighbors had a, a horse that fell off the edge of the gully, was stuck in the glop down below, it was mud, and the horse couldn't get out, so they brought, brought other horses up and they're trying to pull this horse out of the gully. And mom said, go tell him that Franklin Delano Roosevelt has died. Um, and I remember the shock that uh, the men had who were working up there, this president that they so liked. And of course, then Truman came in. We had then, all this time, nuclear uh, atomic bombs were being tested. And um, when we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I still remember my mother's sense of something awful has happened. She was, she was so profoundly touched by what we had done, even though it was called the enemy. What did that mean to drop bombs and incinerate people and then do it a second time at Nagasaki? It just didn't make any sense to her. So I know that I somehow got um, some, my sense from how my mother's reaction to that. She had a strong influence on my life. One of the greater lessons of my life as, as a kid was my sister. I got really mad at my sister who was just younger than I. And I remember hitting her. And she held up her arm and refused to hit me back. And the harder I hit her, the more she refused. Until finally I broke out in tears. And I think it was the, my first lesson in nonviolent communication. She knew that we were not to fight, and she refused to strike back. Same time, she protected herself. But it, it had a profound um, influence on me. As you can tell, I still remember it so like it was yesterday of my striking out at her. Um, when the war ended, I remember getting in this pickup truck that belonged to the neighbors, and we all went in the back of this truck up to the celebration. And it was kind of a strange thing. The war was over. Um, what were we celebrating? And was there going to be peace? It was supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, at Ainiwitak, I don't know if you know that, there's an atoll there in the Pacific, near the Marshall Islands. They had been dropping bombs from 1945, I think, to, to 58. They dropped 43 nuclear bombs on those little islands at that time, testing was going on. Some of the people had gotten off, others, I keep wondering what's happened to those islands because it, um, with that much nuclear stuff, it just mm, can't be. When I was graduating from high, college, uh, from high school, I love science and our teacher, Mr. Warnicking, um, I had him all four years of, and I took all the science I could get. And um, when I was starting to be ready to graduate, it was about two weeks before um, graduation high school. And he said to me, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I knew that we didn't have money. We were very, didn't ha we simply didn't have money. So I knew I couldn't go to college. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I got in a farm magazine. There was a little thing saying being an airline attendant. So I thought, I can do that. And I sent it in. And so I, he said, when he asked me, what are you going to do? I said, well, I think I'll be on airlines at that day. They were called stewardess. And, he, and he, the look on his face, he said, oh, you don't want to do that, do you? <laughs> now, it wasn't that there's something wrong with being an airline attendant, but he had so much more, I call it, hope in me to do something more with my life. And his saying that totally... I, it, it just struck me so deeply of his really caring about me and wanting me to go on to college. And I thought, I can't do it. Well, it turned out our pastor at the church there, he thought I had a vocation to religious life. And so he said, well, what are you? So I had to keep thinking about Mr. Warnicking saying, oh, you don't want to do that. And I thought, well, what do I want to do? So I thought, well, I, didn't, I really didn't know what religious life was. And I thought, well, maybe, well, I'm trying to. So the pastor said, uh, talked to me, and he said, what about jo um, joining a religious community? And I said, oh, I didn't, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and he said, well, if I don't hear from you in two weeks, I'll send in a card. So I thought, mm, anyway. And then about three weeks later, he was kind of grumpy. 
I said, well, you said you'd send in the card if I didn't come back in two weeks. So he had sent in a penny coast card, and that's how I became a sister. Uh, it's quite, um, <laughs> think about, um, people think, you know, this big call. Well, all it was is somebody kind of uh, ignorant in some ways <laughs> to saying, well, I might as well give it a try. My mom and my brother drove me there to across Nebraska and uh, uh, Wisconsin. And I remember when they stopped, my brother said, when their mom and he were leaving, said, do you think we ought to take her home? <laughs> it was like, was this a mistake? And mom said, no, let's let her give it a try. And so uh, here I am <laughs> later. Um, I went to um, the community I joined as a teaching community, very involved in social justice. Um, so wanting, uh, um, we had what was called the Green Bible. It was actually a, a, a teaching book that was written for social justice, all the different teachings around social justice. And in our teaching, we always use that. So social justice is big. Um, I went to a number of places, lived, or started out in Cheyenne, Wyoming. There was one youngster that was always giving me um, a bit of a hassle. I'm still in touch with him, he's 65 now. Uh, Bobby Evanick was his name. And Bobby, he had these gorgeous eyes and um, because he was, I suppose we'd probably classify him under something like ADD or something now, I don't know about the time. He, he moved a lot. And so I set Bobby right in the front so I could kind of keep turning. And one of the things, I always told the kids stories and I read to them a lot. At the end of the day, we always had a half hour with storytelling and reading. And I remember I was told him about, we had a lot of wild stories about my childhood of, they weren't wild, but the things that happened, the dogs and the horses and cows and everything. And um, Bobby, I remember this one, after I told one story, he said, looked at me, and this great sigh and said, why did all the good times have to happen in the old days? <laughs> uh, I was probably 11 years older than he at the time. Um, then I went to um, South Dakota, Pipe, near Pipestone, Minnesota, was on the other side and began to get in touch with what we had done to the Native American population. It's a place where the pipestone is where they do the pipes, uh, the pipes are made, that red clay that's done there. Um, we didn't, um, when I first went there, we didn't have a television, we got one. And I remember the first time I turned on the television and the Vietnam War stuff was on. And here was this big, huge airplane and they were bringing body bags off. Um, I cried. I did. It was like these are young people that are coming back in these body bags and being unloaded off these planes. Later on, they stopped doing that because it so touched people. Uh, kind of began the raising of the issues around we shouldn't be there. Um, um, I um, let's see. During the summer. Um, I just want to tell you this because it's, I think for so many young people who have been sexually abused, there was a fellow in our neighborhood who I think really abused every girl probably in the, in the rural area. And I was among the older, probably 11 something, and I always felt so guilty about that because I couldn't, I couldn't go to my folks and tell them about it. In those days, that was a terrible, we call it sin, <laughs> uh, the fact that couldn't you talk about it? And he was, he was abusive. I suppose now we'd call him a pedophile, I don't know. Um, and all my life I had not been able to uh, talk about this. And one of the women who was at this place in South Dakota listened to me. And it was one of those times in my life where I was able to talk about it and get it out. And it was like I was totally freed. I keep wondering how many young people live with that um, whatever it is, it's, it's a terrible feeling and not able to talk about it. And I was able to talk about it. In this sense, I felt euphoric. Here I was 26 year old, the first time I'd been able to talk about it. And um, for two and a half days, I was just on a mountaintop. <laughs> and then I turned around and here behind me, this image was of these huge mountains that were there for me to climb. And I hadn't been able to do it because this little molehill had been stuck on my path and I couldn't see over it. Uh, so I would encourage anyone, if you're stuck on something out of the past, find somebody you can talk to about it because it's incredibly freeing. Uh, gives you a new life. Um, 
in, um, I went from there to Green Bay, went from Green Bay to Palatine, and went, Palatine is in Illinois outside of Chicago. I was teaching there. Ivan Illich, who was a fellow, um, not the story of Tolstoy, but this Ivan Illich was a guy who had done a lot of work with um, uh, Central America and Latin America, and um, he was giving a talk. And we went there, and I, <laughs> this one of, he said, uh, we were a bunch of teachers all gathered together. And he said, mark my word, in a few short years, you will be paying to advertise for other companies. We all said, no, I can't pay. In a few short years, who are we? We, we pay, buy shirts that say Nike, Sock, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. all that. We pay them to advertise for them. It's just so, you keep thinking, what, how is it that this corporations have taken this over in so many ways? Um, Anyway, I've always been grateful for Ivan Illich. Um, I then went to, um, I got a position as campus ministry at Oshkosh University, um, part of the Wisconsin system. And as there, I began to get in touch with nuclear power. They were putting stuff over on two rivers, uh, some of the, right on Lake Michigan. If any of those things ever collapse, the whole Lake Michigan, all the water from Chicago is drawn out of Lake Michigan. So it's beginning to, what what's it mean to protest this stuff and getting students involved in it? So it was, it was uh, kind of um, enlightening for me and to find students who were anxious to be part of this. And it had, a, I think right now in this country, in Georgia, fracking. Is anybody doing anything with fracking? Who here is working with fracking? The name sounds like what it is. It's a terrible thing that's happening. They're pumping this stuff down into these tubes with sand, water, and chemicals, and we don't know what the chemicals are. And this stuff can go miles underground, or aquifers. Nebraska, at least, is standing up and saying no to it. Um, I'm very involved right now with the fracking uh, industry. Uh, the Vietnam War ended in either 72 or 75. It depends on who you're talking to. At that time, I had a chance. Buckminster Fuller, anybody know Buckminster Fuller? He was, uh, he was talking, and I went to a site. He had a way of inspiring people, and the imagination just went wild because he was probably 30 years ahead of his time. Uh, whatever he said, it was just like, ah, uh, uh. It kind of wanted to just be a part of it all. It was, it was so, um, he had power in his imagination. I keep thinking, we live by our images, and he was able to do that. He, he would put images out there, and you, could, you wanted to go for them, um, whatever they were. I also had that time to see Margaret Mead. I was at this lake, um, this place called Green Lake, and I saw this little woman walking across. She was about this high, kind of short. It's gonna, and I thought, well, who is she? But she walking with such confidence. Here was Margaret Mead. And I thought, I had a chance in my life, not that I really talked to her, but the sense I saw her, and I saw the power that came from her. She was light, and it, it inspired me. Um, I then went to, um, I got real close to one of the guys at campus ministry and I thought, mm, this isn't where I belong. So I decided I needed four years, it was after four years, I needed to, I applied for a grant and got into Fordham University. And while there, um, there was a fellow, this old fellow came to talk to our class and here was Thomas Berry. Now I didn't know who Thomas Berry was, but he was one who had done all sorts of work with Pierre de Chardin and it all had to do with the new cosmology. And uh, Brian Swim was a follower of uh, Thomas Berry, so that opened up a whole new vista for me for uh, work. It was during that year that the women, church women in El Salvador were killed. Uh, what is this that's going on in El Salvador? Um, from Fordham, I went to Omaha, and that's when I began to do serious protests out at SAC base, it's Strategic Air Command. Um, we would go every uh, Holy Innocence Day, which is always in December, it's miserable weather, and protest out there. Um, one of the things, the first time you walked on the base and you got arrested, you always got a letter of uh, saying you're not welcome. And then the second time you went on, it was three months prison. Um, the judge that always did the hearings there in Omaha, he was tough. And it was always three months if you went on the second time. Um, well, one Ash Wednesday, um, Pam, who was one of our sisters, um, 
we decided that because at the chapel there at Sac Base, they have these huge stained windows. And one of the stained window, glass windows is of Aine Weetok. And it's this, the, the atomic bomb shown in the stained glass. And another one of the windows is the red telephone. You know the red telephone uh, between Russia and, OK. The stained glass with, in a chapel, Aine Weetok, Red thing, and then the huge main window is of a. It was a guy in huge armor, like protecting, but there are lightning bolts and all this. Stuff. So we thought this is really not appropriate that this kind of stained glass should be in a chapel. So um, we were. I wore the habit for 14 years, and we no nine years, something, whatever it was. Anyway, we changed. Our community changed. We just wore cigarette clothes. But up in the attic of this old convent was a bunch of cloth that was from the habits that we used to make. So we got this cloth and we made long pieces that went down and over the back and we put repent on it. And we got another woman to drive us onto the base saying we were gonna to go to mass at the chapel, which we were. So, and I had written up a thing about the stained glass windows. So we got there early, put the things in the pews so people were coming in and, and then we stood out with our repent thing on it. And people thought we were part of the Ash Wednesday service, I think, when they went in. And uh, everything was fine. We went in for mass, and everything was fine. And then when we came out, um, we saw coming down the, <laughs> these guys and all these regalia. And we thought, mm, it looks like they're coming after us. And sure enough, they were. Um, <laughs> so they took us in and separated us. The woman who drove us on didn't have any plan of being part of this, but she got implicated because we were there. So they separated all three of us and wanted to know what we, how we got on, what we were doing. I don't know what they thought we were, you know, we were nonviolent. It was just kind of the thing. Well, there wasn't too much they could do with us, and of course they could use. The saddest part for me was the young fellow who led us on, and they brought him in. Uh, he walked by us, and I, I've, often, I've often felt sad about that because he didn't, um, they were after somebody to blame, really. And they couldn't blame us, so they blamed him. I think some of the, I really don't know what happened to him, but um, I, I hope he understands now. Um, while I was at Oshkosh, I want to go back just one bit. There was a fellow who was giving a talk to the RAs, and was, the huge auditorium was filled, uh, all students. and. The guy, anything that people brought up, he would put them down. And then it was, whether it was religion, this, that, whatever it was, he put them down. And we all said, that, what is this that they brought this guy in? Who was, and it turned out um, he was African-American, although he was very white. He looked white. And, uh, and finally, about halfway through, well, maybe halfway through, he said, what's going on here? Well. Of what is going on? And he said, here, you let me put you down, you down, you down, you down, and nobody you didn't get together. He said, you could have all gotten up, stood up, and walked out. I would have been less standing here on the stage by myself. Mm. So it was a huge lesson of how do we get together to do what we need to do to oppose that which needs to be transformed. We gotta do it together. There's no longer any lone wolf. We're, we're in this together. We're gonna do it together or it won't happen. So that was a huge lesson for me. Then when I was um, here in Omaha, I was at the College of St. Mary. Uh, this priest is named Bob there. He was having a class. I went into the class and um, I liked the class. It was on social justice. And this one day I came late and I noticed he was talking to one of the students who's a little bit older. And she stayed out. Anyway, he came and he started a class. I slipped in, and knowing I was late, and another student. And then all of a sudden, she came in. He started yelling at her, like, what are you doing? You're destroying my whole class. You throw me off. I can't think of nothing. He raved on, and we were all, what's that thing? And finally, he stopped, and he said, what's going on here? And all this came back to me. He said, you let me rave on, and nobody stood up for her. I thought, yep. And after the class, he got me and he said, and you, who know what it is to be persecuted, you did not stand up. And I hadn't. So I think any time you have an opportunity to stand up to, with other people, it's no doing it alone, I think, stand up. Let your voice be heard. Uh, 
we have power that a lot of times we don't recognize. We, we have power. There's power. Um, there's a little YouTube, it talks about, uh, it shows where the first person to stand up is not the leader, it's the second one that comes in. I like that because it means if the second one will do it, more will do it. So uh, if you're not the first one, be the second one or the third or the fourth. Again, we, we need us all to do it. Um, let's see, then um, the protesting out at SAC. Um, I got my, the first ban, on, they call it ban and bar, you're not supposed to come back. And so the next time I went on again, there was a huge number of people, about 340, I think, people did the protest, walked on the base, we all got arrested, we put in this huge auditorium, and they process you, they give you um, mugshot numbers, all this stuff, and written up and saying you can't, it's not to come back. Well, this, this was my second time, of course, I knew I was kind of playing with fire here, so. I was in, in the auditorium, I was over with a group of people and processing was going on and um, it was taking a long time. And this voice, I, I, I say it was a voice, I don't know what else to call it, but I heard, it's time to leave. I thought, well, where is this coming? And um, so I, the group I was talking to, I said, well, I, I need to go now. And they said, ah, where are you going? You know, you're, we're locked into this thing. And I said, I don't know. I just heard this voice that says it's time to leave. Uh, well, some of my friends were being processed, and she came out. And I thought, well, so I walked over to her, and I said, well, what is it that you got? And so she showed me her letter. And they were on their way. They took them out to the bus, and they dropped them out, off outside the gates. I often thought about Peter and the Acts of the Apostles, how this happened. So I said, well, let me see it. And so she showed it to me. She said, so I just kept walking with her and walked out the door, <laughs> got on the bus, and was dropped outside the gate. Huh? <laughs> now, it was, um, I have no idea. I was simply led. Uh, uh, there's nothing else. I can't attribute to anything else other than spirit leading. I, I guess I did what I wanted. I, I'm telling you this. Pay attention to what you hear. Your intuition, I think, tells you a lot about what, you, what we need to, uh, need to do. What, what's speaking to you at this point in your life that says, this is something, yeah, I need to keep doing, working on, try it out. Well, then the third time, uh, let's see, the third time I knew um, I went on, I'm claustrophobic. And I got my letter to show up for prison and or for the court hearing. And the more I thought about this, the worse it got for me because anybody here claustrophobic, it's a sense of everything just kind of moves in. It. And I became terrorized. And at the college, they had had a, a person who was a hypnotist had come one time and shown, uh, had hypnotized, it was during, um, finals week and people were exhausted. That's evidently when you can be really hypnotized easily. And um, this one, I can still see this one girl chasing this bird. Well, there was no bird at all, but it was the power of suggestion and thing. So I thought, what am I going to do? Because I thought I could lose my mind in jail. I just, I didn't know if I could do it. And so I went to this, this place and I thought, well, maybe I can be hypnotized. And she said, you're not a likely candidate. <laughs> but she said, she, I, you lay out on this thing. And she said, I want to hear your story. And so I started to tell her why I was so, why I was protesting. What was about nuclear weapons that I, SAC Air Force Base, these airplanes that fly around 24-7 carrying a nuclear weapon, could destroy the whole earth, whole earth. And why it was so important. And I started to cry, and she kept daubing my eyes. And I finally finished telling her everything that I had to say. I was, I was in tears. And she said, I want you to stay here. I thought, OK. And I, well, two hours went by. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> it was restful, at least. Um, and finally, she came back. And she said, I want to assure you everything's going to be OK. I had no idea what she meant. So the hearing came up, and Pam and I went to the hearing. Um, and for the first time, 
this, the, the judge, rather than giving a sentence, said, tell me your story. I am so convinced that this woman got in touch with the judge and told him the story, my story. And he, it was the first time he ever let anybody off without having three months in jail. And because of my, I think she must have interceded because of my terror about going to prison. So I got a year's probation, had to show up at the probation officer every month. Uh, he was not happy. Um, I don't know whether he was just not a happy man or whether he just had something that he was kind of aggravated that I was not in prison. Um, so every time he showed up, finally on the 10th showing up, he said, I don't want to ever see you again. I would come in and they have stuff on the wall like join, you know, um, it was usually military stuff. And I said, I think you ought to take this down. We could just move it. Don't you touch it. Don't you touch it. So anyway, we had a, 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 part, a parting at that point. Um, um, I think at that point, uh, the, we had a new president of the college. I think he was a little bit threatened because he was trying to get men, women, mostly men at that time, from the air base to be students at the college. And there I was sitting at the gate, huh, which didn't look good because uh, having the campus minister from the college protesting while they were trying to get something in. So uh, at the end of that fourth year, he, after school was out, he called me and said, we're changing the job to half time. And I said, I can't do half time. So um, I said, OK, can't do half time. What will I do? And um, it was time to leave. So I didn't quite know what to do that summer. The next, during that summer, we got a call from New Orleans asking if we'd come down. Some of us would work in a housing development that the diocese owned down there. And I always think, this is the beginning of the education of Liz Sully. Uh, there was so much, I swear, I began to get in touch with white privilege. Because we could say th uh, housing developments, um, huge places of, I found so much depression, and yet I found so much hope. Uh, now, because I was in education, we worked with the kids. So we had, we had a center right in the middle. Um, we tried to do all sorts of programs. Uh, young, so we did a lot with scouting and after school stuff and all that. And, um, one of the sad things about the education there, all the kids from the, the project, really, it was the housing development. But they, when they went to the school, they were all put in the same classroom because they, were, they didn't have uh, educational opportunities. And so they were, it was just bad because they, grew up, uh, they couldn't mix, they didn't mix with other kids. They, didn't, they lacked that opportunity. I remember Chaotic came home. We had a volunteer working at us. And this volunteer I always used the word um, pathetic. And um, Kayata, who was still in third grade, should have been fifth grade, she walked in one day and she sent, we had a desk there and she sent it, and she slapped a report card and went on. And anyway, she said, pathetic, just pathetic. And I thought, okay. And I picked up a report. She had all Fs. What future is there for a youngster to have all Fs? Um, when I first came there, two little girls who were preschool. They kept throwing rocks and bottles at me because they didn't know who I was and kind of suspicious of who I was. And finally, um, kind of gained their confidence a little bit by keep talking with them and doing things. And finally one day, the one says, Tasha says you're her grandma. And Tasha, I thought for some reason, was scared. And I said, oh, well, maybe I could be. So uh, the other one looked like, well, how, how can that be? So, Anyway, the, the next day they came back and she said, Tasha's grandma says you can be her white grandma. I said, okay, I'm your white grandma. I'll be good. It worked. Um, it was while we were there, uh, again, the white privilege. Um, I keep thinking, oh, like the kids would get kicked out of school we, because we had a car. We could take the mothers there to get the kids back in school. And it was only because we had white privilege, we had a car. Huh? Or we could go intercede for them at different places. And because we, people would say, oh, well, yeah. And then it could, we tried to empower the people and have them speak for themselves. But it was still I, it was white, white privilege. And I keep thinking, if you're white and you don't know white privilege, get on it. Because we whites are privileged. It's white privilege. Um, 
it was during that time we had the Iran Contra thing going on. If you, uh, um, Ali North, who was getting money to give to the Contras in Nicaragua, did terrible things down there. So we were protesting that. I, so many great lessons that I learned there. One was a there had some veterans group had sponsored some essay contest, and this young woman who had won the contest. Um, they were having a big parade, and she was sitting on the back of a convertible. You know how they put down the curtain, you sit there. And there are a whole bunch of things. Anyway, we went down to protest the Iran Contra thing. So we had our signs there sitting very glum, you know, like, hum, hum. and she came by on her and she waved, and we, you know, we didn't say a thing. When she got to the end of the line, she got off the convertible and came back and joined us. That took so much courage to do that. And of course, the next day, it was in the paper. The group wanted to take away her winnings that she got from the essay because she was, uh, did a terrible thing and was uh, betraying what they stood for and all. It was pretty awful. But I, kept, I wrote to this young woman, she was living in California, and told her how much I appreciate it. I kept in touch with her for a couple of years, but I lost track. Um, I, part of my education there, I remember one little youngster came out and said, what is this sister? Oh my God, there was an Uzi. I'd never seen an Uzi before. It was just, it was amazing. Um, drugs were rampant. It wasn't until after I left that I found out that the manager's husband was the, the big dealer on the whole West Bank there. He controlled all the drugs. Um, it, it was kind of amazing because anytime druggers would come on and we walked out there, people would say, leave the sisters alone. Hmm. Again, we were kind of quite privileged, I suppose, in some ways, because they never bothered us. But the kids were really our protection, because they wanted the center and they would do anything to, to have this going on. Um, one time, I had this really great camera that I had gotten in Omaha from a woman who had cancer. Her family got it to me after she died, because they knew I was uh, taking a camera course, a photography course. And the cameras, well, a couple of guys came in the center and the kids would usually say, watch out for that one. They wouldn't move their lips, they'd say, say blah, blah, blah. they knew who was who, and of course we didn't. And my camera was missing. And I thought, oh, I, I felt so sad. I told the kids about how it was in. Next day, the camera was back. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't happen, but the kids, they, had, they knew who what was going on and they, they were the ones who interceded and got it back. So, uh, Glenn, one of, I just love Glenn. He was such a great help there. His mother always liked him to be at the center because she knew he'd be out of trouble. Um, I've kept in touch with Glenn, found out Glenn has been in prison at Angola for the last five and a half years. And he was arrested by it. They said that he was with an underage girl. Glenn said, I wasn't. Now, knowing what I know about the police department, it's, um, anyway. So I've started to work with um, the Justice Initiative thing out of, um, um, yeah, I put that on your paper there, out of, um, uh, my time is up, huh? Montgomery. Um, and it's Brian Stevenson, if you can get, you look at that YouTube, um, Equal Justice Initiative. So we're gonna see if we can get Glenn out of prison. He doesn't belong there, it's a terrible. Angola is a horrible place. I don't think anybody belongs in prison. Our prison system is desperate. Um, I'll hurry by here. Um, it was during that time also that uh, Thomas Gumbleton, who was a, he said, it's going to happen, we're going to go to Gulf War. And I thought, it can't possibly be. I was leaving the place at that time. I want to tell you, oh, I came down for Kings Bay in Georgia where they have the nuclear subs, protested down there. I think it's even more important with global, with climate change, if in fact, all of our naval stations are at level of the edges of the uh, land, they're all gonna be underwater if the, if the water rises to one foot. They said that that chunk of um, ice glacier drops off of Antarctica in maybe 100, 200, 300 years, who knows, the water level will rise 11 feet and many people will be underwater. I, my whole focus has so changed, not focus, it's in, included huh? um, to climate change. If you're working on anything, I think, move in. What, what, first of all, what is it that drives you? I think we have all these huge issues. Um, has anybody gone to the death penalty protests? 
Now, it's the day before, uh, or the night before the executions down at the Capitol, right near you here. You get on down there, because there's something about putting your feet there that you see, ah, this is uh, being there. Um, capital punishment, I think. Huge. We kill people to kill people. Who kill people to kill it? Prove that killing's wrong. Uh, it's crazy. Not, not from my perspective. Um, Trafficking, uh, whole issues around trafficking, uh, uh, immigration, prison reform. Um, what else? Things that I've been working on, the, the great need for all sorts of reconciliation. Homelessness. I just came from, I volunteered on Our Lady of Lourdes and folding little napkins. <laughs> um, anyway, that, that um, what we did in Latin and Central America with the NAFTA, all those people were deprived now of their work. They had to move off the farms because we subsidize our farmers here in this country. We ship it down there. They can't compete. And now we're having these huge drug wars and things with El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, all this stuff. That's and it's because I really believe because of NAFTA. The next one is going to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership. If you have not studied any of that, get with it because it's it's going to be huge. It's, all these corporations have organized this whole thing, and the corporations are in it for greed. And we need to do something to um, change that. It's really NAFTA on steroids, yeah, study into that. Um, I keep going down to Fort Benning. been down there a number of times. I just want to tell you one story about Fort Benning. One of the times uh, I'd been on and the second time, again, you get prison thing. This time that I went on, there were a large group of us that went on, and they separated us all out. Again, it takes a long time to do the processing because you get your paper, your mugshot, all that stuff. At the end of the time, because it had gone on till late, kind of late in the evening, past 7 o'clock, the commander at the base decided that he would feed us. I call it the Last Supper at Fort Benning <laughs> because it was... This sense, they had this line and they kept bringing out food and we would all come through and had something to eat. It was one of the most reconciling experiences of, I've often thought the guy probably lost his post because I don't, it never happened again. Huh? It's just, uh, it's uh, anyway, it was a profound experience of, of um, his compassion. I keep thinking it's the compassion on the people and that's what inspired him to, do this. They kept bringing out more and more food. What time is it? So it's, it's, uh, you and I just want to make sure people have time to ask questions if they have any questions. Okay. Um, I, I just want to pass these things out, if you would. For um, I ran the. I, I was over at Staples yesterday trying to run this. I was cutting and pasting. I thought all of you would laugh at me because here I was um, <laughs> cutting and pasting uh, to get it. Uh, the one side is just. Um, I mean, it's part of nonviolent communication. It's a guy by the name of um, Max, uh, Neef, Max Manfred Neef. Uh, is there an extra one? Okay, thanks. Um, these really, in the center, it says needs. You can't read that very well, part of the cutting of the page. It's also needs and values. And he said these are, these are universal. If we could begin to see that these are needs that everybody does. He, in nonviolent communication, it says, Everything that we do is to meet some kind of need or value. And if you look at those values, it's what everything we do comes out of something from there. Now, it might not be the best choice because we might do it for the wrong reason. Huh? Um, but I find I hang this. It's on my mirror so I can look at it every day and say, okay, okay, what am I going to focus on today? What value, what need am I going to stand for today? Then on the flip side, I found... I've just had a meeting recently, and David Snowden has this thing on the uh, Kinevin thing, talking about, I think so much of life, we try to live, we want it to be simple, huh? Live simply, I think is good, but life is not simple. So how do we look up in these the categories around complicated, complex? If we can live up in those two, I, I looked at complex and I thought, our planet, Earth, is like this huge Rubik's Cube because every time you shift one thing, absolutely everything else shifts. It's, it's, we live in a complex, and we have to be awake and alive to that because it's not going to be the same. 
uh, as living in a simple life or complicated. Where it's complicated, you know, like a rocket going to the moon. Well, it's complicated to do that, but you can repeat it again. So it can be, but complex, this moment right now, just think this moment will never ever be repeated again. This is complex, huh? our sitting here together in this. And then down below for leadership, it doesn't take much to do, I shouldn't take, it doesn't say take much management, but between order and control, um, that's where management comes in. But when you get order and chaos, now chaos doesn't mean total, it's not destructive chaos, but where things are complex, that's where you need leadership. So try to step into that. So I want to know what you're going to do with your one wild, precious life. Yes. Can I just start with saying thanks. Well, you're for welcome. This, you. For the stories, which, uh, which I'm what did it the, do for you? The oldest one, <laughs> one here, <laughs> some of which really resonated, but also for the um, the things that we read, the poems, the uh, excerpts uh -huh. that, that that were just really very powerful for me in many ways. Uh -huh. so Thank you. What did it do for you? Uh, and gratitude, for yeah. Me? The gratitude. Or well, the, and or gratitude, the when you look at gratitude, what did it do for you? I'm just trying to coach you on um, the, how we express gratitude. Um, just in this very moment, uh -huh. I guess, uh, was it too facile? It was well meant. I mean, I, I, I truly meant that. Oh, I know that, yeah. But can you tell? Can you state what it did? For, what it what it does for you? For example, those poems. What did that oh, do for you? The poems. Uh -huh. The poems were very um, affirming in many ways, and also some of them I had I was familiar with. Uh -huh. What will you do with your one wild and precious uh -huh. life? Uh -huh. um, others left me with questions. Um, at this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, at least of all ourselves. Okay. So it yeah. stimulated inquiry, questioning. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Gratitude. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm just when talking about gratitude, always talking about what it did for you. Um, how that's how I began the class. Right. Because I yeah. it takes a lot of work, but it's so a lot of times in school we talk to kids. Oh, you're so great. Well, that. See, a kid that doesn't feel they're great doesn't do anything but add violence to it. Huh? Where if I can say, you know, John, when you raised your hand on that, I was so grateful because I was looking for somebody. Or when, when you helped that kid get the boots on, I, I was really inspired by that because you cared about him. I'm telling him not who he is or her who she is, but I'm telling him what, what they do for me. Huh? It's, it's just, yeah, yes. I, I appreciate you talking because you gave us like perspective. Like you were, uh, I don't think you understand like what you were saying about like um, about World War II, about everybody pitching in, because that was the last time where everybody like did their part in order to further the, further the war effort. Then you mentioned uh, Buckminster Fuller, who like discovered C60 and C70, 72. And that's the reason why we have like all these smartphones and laptops. And yeah. Everybody has the devices, but they don't know where the material comes from. Yeah. You know. And then you talked about the Vietnam War, but it was just like this sweeping perspective that's <coughs> been lost about uh -huh. like uh, how people wear brand names and advertise. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, and know that your cell phones. I'm probably the only person in the world that doesn't have a cell phone. Um, know that your cell phones, there are people where those minerals that are being used in the cell phones are working for nothing and are almost slaves. I think we, uh, we got to look at that. Oh, and the other thing, when you mentioned FDR, a lot of people didn't know, probably don't know that, uh, there were no term limits back then. And FDR was president for like 16 years. Mm -hmm. I always think um, FDR, really Eleanor, his wife, was probably the real leader. <laughs> She's the one who started the uh, human, uh, universal human rights, which I think we've got to go far beyond the universal human rights because it's much more. I 
I had another question. That sure. I'm a little hard of hearing. Um, so. Did you do you perceive that your vocation or being involved in your your the life that you've been involved uh -huh. in, and sort of having to some degree perhaps the things like the bishop's um, letter, uh, the bishop's uh -huh. conference letter. Did that empower you? Did that give you an extra sense of, of the courage to do some of the things that you did that um, along the way? Yeah. Um, I think um, my community is very supportive. And like we went out to Nevada test site, all those things, a whole group of us protesting. So it's, I think we've got to move beyond protests, though. Because it, it is an action in a way, and yet, yeah. And I think. The, the, the thing that I put in there about the bishops, um, thing that they had on uh, the Peace Pastoral, there's a, a new statement that's going to be coming out that's absolutely saying absolutely no nuclear weapons. Uh, annihilate them. You need to do away with them. So it's, going to, it's an even a stronger statement than what's there, and it's coming out. I guess it's already been published just, just this past week. It came from the Pope saying um, it's immoral to even possess nuclear weapons. That's pretty strong, and a lot of people won't like that or won't agree with it. Yes? Um, you were talking about your family's influence on, um, on your sort of path towards mm -hmm. um, activism. I was wondering how faith informs um, the activism that you do and the protests. It's all the way through because I think Jesus was always with the marginated, he was always compassionate, he always stood with those. Um, who were uh, in need, and um, yeah, it threads it throughout. Because I, I wouldn't be doing it if I think if that weren't if I weren't uh, if that weren't in my core. <laughs> it's kind of uh, yeah, and it's with others. I keep thinking of the multitudes. Yes. No, I'm sorry. I have to wrap it up. But okay. I want to thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just want to show you this picture. This has inspired me all my life since that happened. Tenement Square. <laughs>